So we always complain that they do not teach us personal finance in school. We learn about geometry, algebra, trigonometry, Latin, history. And we always complain there's no information about personal finance. I wish someone had taught us that. Well, today is your lucky day. So here we are on the investor.gov website. It's a U.S. government website maintained by the SEC. And if you don't know, the SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission, the branch, which is the branch of the federal government that is involved in investing and trading and that type of thing. And the SEC that goes after people for insider trading, right? So they have this great website. I did a video, I think last week, where I use their calculator. They have a great uh, compound calculator and other tools. There's great information about looking up the credentials or the background of potential financial advisors you're considering, work, you're considering working with. Um, there's um, a ton of information there. So definitely in 2024, I'm gonna be bringing information from this website because I think it can be very beneficial. But like I said, today is gonna to be back to school. There's a monthly quiz, which uh, I will bring to you as well. And just really getting into this website and increasing our financial IQ so we can break the cycle of generational poverty. 10 questions today. So here we are. Question number one. Olive and Mark start working in the same year and plan to retire after 40 years. You know, we don't believe in working for 40 years, but let's, let's go on. Olive contributes $500 per month until retirement in an employer-sponsored retirement plan. That is smart, right? Employer-sponsored retirement plan, like maybe a 401k, 403b, 457, okay? Mark doesn't make any retirement contributions for 20 years. Then contributes $2,000 per month for the, re for the remaining 20 years. So Mark doesn't make any retirement contributions for 20 years. Then contributes $2,000 per month for the remaining 20 years. So we see Olive, so they're both working 40 years. Olive started investing from the beginning, $500 a month in the employer-sponsored plan. Mark waits 20 years, but he contributes four times as much, $2,000 a month for the remaining 20 years. Assume both employees earn an average investment return of 7% for their contribution. So they're getting a 7% return. After 40 years, who will have more retirement plan assets? So this is a real life situation, right? This is a real life situation. You know, we believe in investing in the S&P 500 or the total market index. And you can get about 10% return, right? That's before taxes, right? So this is not too far off. So the only difference between these two is that Olive is only putting $500 in, but she has 20 years extra than Mark. Mark is putting in four times as much, $2,000. But he only had 20 years. I already did the math in the computer. I already did the math in the calculator. The question is who has more assets? Olive had more time. Even though it's less money, it's more time. And that matters more. Olive, $500 a month for 40 years, the 7% will end up with $1,312,406. About $1.3 Mark, even though he's putting in more money, $2,000 a month, he only has 20 years, so he has less time. He's, both, he's also getting 7% return. He has 1,041,853. So not bad, right? So Olive has about 270,000 more. Okay? So the important point in this question is that The important point of this question is that between the two variables of money investing or time, time is the most important. Time is the most important. That's why 
even if you can only invest fifty dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever, get it in the market. So who has more? Olive has more. So let's look at question number two. Anyone can check the background of an investment professional for free on investor.gov. We'll say the answer is true. So it's a great website, right? So we can go in. You're considering investing with a professional. You can check your background, see whether there's been any complaints or so on. Let me add this real quick. And I'll do, I'll do a, probably a separate video on, you know, do I need a financial advisor? I'll probably do a separate video. But for the majority of us in the early stages, I don't think we do. I think you can do fine with, your, with investing on yourself, getting yourself educated, using an index fund. I think you can do fine. When you start getting into more complex stuff, um, such as estate planning, um, starting a trust, other complex things, then maybe. And when you do get a, a financial advisor, get a fiduciary, someone that acting on your best interest and a fee only advisor, whether it's whatever, hundred dollars an hour, two hundred dollars an hour, there's a fee. You don't want to be paying people a percentage of assets under management, right? So you got a one million dollar portfolio and they're getting a one percent fee, that's ten thousand dollars you give them for the year. I mean, you know. So Anyone can check the background of an investment profession for free on investor.gov. Will stay true. Then number three, investment in crypto asset security can be exceptionally volatile and speculative. I'm going to say yes. So, you know, I don't do crypto. I don't talk about that stuff. I'm doing stuff that I understand. These digital wallets and all this stuff. It's nice. It's sexy and all that stuff. But... Number one rule, if you do not understand it, don't put your money into it. So investments in crypto asset securities can be exceptionally volatile and speculative. We are going to say true. And if you are going to use, put money into crypto, make it only a small portion. Number four, naming someone as a trusted contact person, give that person authority to make transactions on your behalf. Hmm. Naming someone as a trusted contact person, give that person authority to make transactions on your behalf. I'm going to say false. <clears throat> because sometimes a trusted contact person is just someone who can maybe update the contact information, address, you know, email, so on, but maybe they can't sell stocks. So I'm going to say Naming someone as a trusted contact person, give that person authority to make transactions on your behalf. I'm going to say false. Right, and these are important stuff that we have to talk about. Question number six. If you buy shares of a company stock, the company will return your original investment to you with interest. I'm going to say false. If you buy shares of a company stock, you're a part owner, but there's no guarantee Every, you know, every investment at risk, the company could go down in value. You could lose value. You could lose all your money, potentially. So we'll say false. So, and that's important to know, right? Because all investments have risk. So you have to know your risk tolerance, your age, um, how long before you need the money, and so on. Asset allocation. You don't want to You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket, okay? Question number seven. What is the main advantage that index funds have when compared to actively manage funds? This is a big one because we've talked about it on this channel before. Index funds are basically a basket of stocks that are tracking a particular index. So the S&P 500 is the most popular index, the 500 biggest most company in America. And you buy an index fund, um, you buy an index fund that's tracking that, it's passively managed. Passively managed. It's just the algorithm that the fund manager is following, the algorithm, right? If the S&P 500 is like 3% Apple, then the index is going to be 3% Apple, and it just tracks it. 
and it's cheaper. The expense ratio is very cheap. So something like VOO, which is the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF that tracks the S&P 500, the expense ratio is like 0 0.03, which means you'll pay about 0 0.03, you'll pay about $3. You'll pay about $3 for every $10,000 invested. And the returns are, you know, you get about 10% return annualized. An actively managed fund is where you have managers actually trying to pick the right stocks that will do well, that will beat the market. And you're going to pay them a higher fee. The expense ratio is going to be much higher, right? So what are the main advantages that index funds have when compared to actively managed funds? Index funds are generally less risky in the short term. No, we'll say index funds have lower fees and expenses. Absolutely. Index funds have lower fees and expenses. Absolutely. And because they have lower fees and expenses, it eats less into your return. Right? Index funds are generally less likely to decline in value. No. Index funds often guarantee a specific rate of return. There's no guarantee in investing. You can always lose money. Index funds have lower fees and expenses. And because of that, you keep more of your money invested and less being paid to the manager. Absolutely. You want a great benefit. Question number eight. If you buy a company's bond, you own part of the company. No. If you buy a company's stock, you own part of the company. A bond is basically a loan. It's like an IOU. So you have different type of loans. You have you have different type of loans or different type of bonds. So you have government bonds, right? You have government bonds. You have like savings bonds. You have corporate bonds, right? You can lo loan money to a company. You have municipal bonds. You loan it to like a local municipality. And those are usually 0% tax. But if you don't own part of the company, so you don't own stock. Stocks are, par stocks are partial ownership of the company. Bond, you are loaning money to the company. So if you buy a company's bond, you own part of the company. False. Question number nine. You see, I love these because... They're like very, they're all over the place. You have questions about um, checking the background of financial advisors. Um, questions about a trusted advisors. Trust, questions about bond stock. This is excellent because if there's an area you need to dig a little deeper, then you know. Listen, let me go dig a little deeper about this um, trusted, um, I think it's called a trusted advisor or something. Question number nine. If you sell your stock before the X dividend date, this is excellent. We've done a video about this. There are several important dates when it comes to dividend stocks. There are several important dates when it comes to dividend stocks. I think there are about four of them. So you have stocks that pay dividend, right? Whether it's Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Home Depot, McDonald's, right? And the board of directors come together and they make a decision and say, we are going to pay a dividend. Usually, you know, dividend of the quarter. We're going to pay a dividend, um, you know, um, next quarter. So the board of directors decide we're going to pay a dividend. That day when they decide that a dividend will be paid is called oh, the declaration date. So there's a declaration date when they declare, the board of directors declare that we're going to pay a dividend. Then you have the record date. You have to be on the books at having ownership in that stock. The record date. And then you have the X dividend date. The X dividend date is probably one of the most important dates. The X dividend date, let me back up. So when they decide that they're going to pay a dividend, 
you have to consider people buying stock, selling stock all the time, right? How do they know when the cutoff is? And the cutoff date is the X. How do they know when the cutoff date is? When there has to be some date. The X dividend date is the date that they use for the cutoff date. Or to be more specific, one business day before the X dividend date is the cutoff date. You have to have you have to be an owner of the stock at least one business day before the X dividend date. It's called the X dividend date. You know, like your X, you guys are no longer together. Normally the stock travels or trades with its dividend. They're together. But on the X date, they the stock trades without its dividend. If you buy the stock on the X dividend date, you do not get the dividend upcoming. Let me repeat that again. If you buy the stock on the X dividend date, the stock is trading without its dividend. It's an X. They're no longer together. Right? So if you buy the stock on the X dividend date, you do not get the dividend. So who gets it? The person who you bought the stock from. The seller gets the dividend. The buyer doesn't get it. In order for you to get the dividend, the next in order for you to get the next upcoming dividend, you have to buy the stock at least one business day before the X dividend date. So the stock market is closed on the weekends and on holidays. So, so at the X dividend day falls on a Sunday. One day before that is a at the X dividend day falls on a Sunday. The bid the next business day before that would be the Friday. So you'd have to own the stock by the Friday. Right? So one business day before the X dividend date. One business day before the X dividend date. So we did the declaration date, we did the record date, and we did the X dividend date. And then the fourth date is the pay date, which is when the money gets transferred into your brokerage. And depending on the brokerage, it may take a day to settle. You may not see it until maybe one day after that. But this is a great question. Question number nine. If you sell your stock, before the X dividend date, you also are selling away your right to the stock dividend. It's a good question. If you sell, because now you right because there's a seller and a buyer. If you sell your stock before the X dividend date, you also are selling away your right to the stock dividend. That is true, right? Because if you sold the stock on the X dividend date, remember, on the X date, the stock trades without its dividend. So if you sold the stock on the X date, the stock is not trading with its dividend. The seller would keep it. But this question says, if you sell your stock before the X dividend date, So the stock is trading with a dividend and you sold it before the X date, you sold away, you're also selling away your right to the stock dividend. True. Excellent question. Question number 10. Joey hears, see I told you this website is really good. Question number 10. Joey hears about an investment opportunity that will pay a guaranteed 50% return every week. You know, whenever you hear guaranteed your ears got to perk up because there's no guarantee. There's always risk. Joey hears about an investment opportunity that will pay a guaranteed 50% return every week. The promoter reiterates that there is absolutely no risk. Joey is suspicious because the investment return seems unrealistic. 50% return every week? That is very high. Right. We're talking about S&P 500 gives you a 10% return annualized every year. And they're saying this investment is giving you a 50% return every seven days. 
the promoter. So the investment return seemed unrealistic. That's true. All investments have risk. That's true. It is likely a scam. That's true. So we'd say all of these. So we got we got nine. We got nine. So we got one wrong. Um, don't know what it is, but we got one of them wrong. So, um, so the first question was um, the two people were investing the money. One um, five hundred dollars a month, and um, one two thousand dollars a month. Seven percent annualized return. But one of them is doing it for forty years, and one is doing it for twenty years. We got that one right, right? Because they said uh, the one that's gonna be doing five hundred dollars a month is gonna have about uh, we said about one point three million. They said about one point two million, and the other one is gonna have about a million. They said about nine hundred eighty-three thousand. So we were we were right. So the, the takeaway message: time in the market. The more you invest it, so the, the sooner you can start investing, the better. If you can start investing. At 20, great. If you can start investing at 15, even better. The, te- the take-home message is, the sooner you can start investing, the better. If you can start investing at 40, great. If you start investing at 35, even better. If you start investing at 30, even better. And it keeps going on. They said the best time to invest was yesterday. The second best time to invest is today. So don't wait. <laughs> Question number two. Um, this is about checking the background of the financial profession. An easy way to check out the background of an investment professional is to use the free search tool available on investor.gov. That's great. You can find out if an investment professional is currently registered or licensed or has been suspended or as well as the individual's qualification and employment history. That's great. But then number three, um, investment in crypto, except exceptionally volatile and speculative. So we got that right. Question number four about a con- the trusted contact person. And we said they cannot make investments. Let's see if that's the one we got wrong. Question number, question number four. A trusted contact is a person your brokerage firm will contact if your broker believes your account may be exposed to possible financial exploitation or fraud. Mm-hmm. They're, so they'll only contact them if they think your account has been exposed to potential fraud. Your broker will also contact your trusted contact person in other situations too. For example, if they are having trouble reaching you or if they suspect you are sick or suffering from diminished capacity. Naming someone as a trusted contact person does not give that person any authority to act on your behalf, execute transactions, or engage in activity in your account. So we did get it right. Question number five. I don't remember the question for question number five, but let's see. You know, this question number five, we may have either clicked it incorrectly because I don't remember it. But it says, question number five, many firms are registered as both a broker and an advisor and offer both advisory and brokerage services and accounts. They're called dual registrants. In some cases, a combination of services and accounts offered by these firms may be a good choice for you depending on your investment goals preferences and needs. If your investment professional offers both brokerage and advisory services, make sure you understand what they're acting. Make sure you understand when they're acting as a broker and when they're acting as an advisor. As a broker, I believe they are basically just conducting the transaction. Like, you know, I have a broker that I buy my stocks in and they just They're just taking care of the transaction. They're not giving me any advice. Advising meaning they're advising. So the question is, make sure you know when they're acting as a broker and make sure you know when they're acting as an advisor. Okay? Because when they're acting as an advisor, they should be a fiduciary. should be acting on your best interest. If they're not, they could be advising you to put your money into stuff to make them money from fees and not to grow your money. I, th- I don't remember that question. I think we might have accidentally pass it. Anyhow, number six, when you own shares of a stock, you own a part of the company and there are no guarantees of profits or even that you will get your original investment back. Good. Number seven, even small differences in fees. Number seven, even, I think there's a question between an index fund and an actively managed fund. Number seven, even small differences in fees can have a significant impact on earnings 
over time, especially over like a long investment career, like 40 years. Compare the fees of mutual funds and exchange traded funds, ETF. And keep in mind that historical data shows that index funds have primarily... And keep in mind that historical data shows that index funds have primarily because of their lower fees enjoyed higher returns than the average actively managed funds because of the lower fees. Because when your fees are high, to get the same return, you have to do better. You have to outperform, outperform the market. And a lot of them are not. Question number eight. Where they said if you own if you buy a bond, you own part of a company? I would say no. A bond is a debt security, similar to an IOU. Borrowers issue bonds to raise money from investors willing to lend them money for a certain amount of time. When you buy a bond, you are lending to the issuer, which may be a government, municipality, or corporation, but you do not own part of the company. As a matter of fact, if the company goes into financial trouble, the bond owners or the bondholders get paid before the stockholders. There's less risk with a bond, especially there's less risk with a bond. That's why they they rate bond like AAA companies like Moody's and stuff. They rate bond like AAA mean like less risk, and you have like BBB, which means the more risk. And you have junk bond, which means higher risk. And the low the lower the risk, lower the return. Higher the risk, higher the potential return. Question number nine: If you sell your stock. And if we went, over, we went over this, question number nine. If you sell your stock before the ex-dividend date, you also are selling away your right to the stock dividend. Your sale includes an obligation to deliver any shares acquired as a result of the dividend to the buyer of your shares. Since the seller will receive an IOU or due bill from their broker for the additional shares. Thus, it is important to remember that the day you can sell your shares without being obligated to deliver the additional shares is not the first business day after the record date. But usually it's the first business day after the stock dividend is paid. Okay? Um, I think we kind of went through that pretty good. Number 10. Every investment has risk. Generally, the higher the returns, the higher the risk. You could even lose all your money. Many fraudsters spend a lot of time trying to convince investors that extremely high returns are guaranteed or can't miss. That was the one that talked about um, 50% return every week and there's no, um, and it's guaranteed and there's no risk. Okay. So again, guys, this is the investor.gov website. There's going to be monthly quizzes and we're going to be going through, and we're going to be going through it. Like a class, like we, like a class, like, like a class that they should have taught us many years ago, but we are going to educate ourselves and our children so we can break the cycle of generational poverty. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube at MD Investor, MD Investor out.